OK, so now we want to look at um, where do accidents actually come from? Because before we can really move forward, we need to understand where we're at. Um, and it's, we might be focusing in the wrong place at this moment in time. Like I said earlier, we've been dealing with the mechanics and not the psychology. So something needs to change. So is everyone here aware of like the domino effect in health and safety, where it says like if you have six things all line up together, then, then you have the accident? Yeah? Cool, you've heard of that. So this is an alternative version of it, of where we're looking at how things come about. So the first two steps are very simple. Number six and number five. These are the symptoms of the problem. They're not the cause of the problem, they're the symptoms. So what's the difference? Well, really, if you had a stagnant pond and it was covered in mosquitoes and you got a flamethrower and killed the mosquitoes, what would happen? Well, eventually, yeah. Eventually, the, they'll come back because you're not changing the water. And this is the symptoms. People nowadays are so hooked on dealing with the symptoms rather than the cause, we're missing the point. So this here is basically your tradesman who has the accident, the person that actually gets hurt, and the supervisor. So what normally happens here, they have an accident. Now, they know they made a mistake. We're human beings, we make mistakes. So they're feeling bad about themselves already. Then we have an accident investigation come into it to make them feel really bad about what they're doing. And also what happens in some places is they get removed from the project or the factory. But they were only the sixth element. There were five elements before them. So the other one was the supervisor. He's there and he tends to get blamed quite a bit. Um, why wasn't he out supervising when he had 100 other jobs to do? Didn't he do the brief beforehand? Wasn't he checking on the guys? So he gets a roasting as well. I'll give you an example of this as well. I mean, this is the way we're responding at this moment in time in most places to accidents. We're actually stopping people from reporting them. We're actually driving under reporting. An example I can do from a couple of years ago is on a project. And one of the lads on a pickup truck had to go down and pick, pick up some elements of fencing and everything. He lowered the back gate on it and trapped his finger. Now, he hurt himself. It's not acceptable. In fact, he ended up having three stitches in the hand as well, which is even worse still. But then they had to do the accident investigation. 54 page long. But not just once. He had to do it four times. And even he said afterwards, that's the last time I'm ever, ever reporting an accident. So we need to think about our actions. So if they're the symptoms, what's the cause? So basically, you've got the four elements beforehand. What are the causes of the accident? Where do they stem from? So I'm going to put a list up here that's not every single item will be relevant to each accident, but every single item at some stage has been a component part in creating an accident. The management, the way it's managed, the actual way it's managed. As we touched earlier about raising the standards, we've got to raise the standards. We've got to hold ourselves to a higher uh, accountability. The design, how often does the design change? And even with CDM rules nowadays, it's very, very good for the maintenance of a building, but there's still elements of the construction stage where we really should be doing better. What about the client? I mean, stock markets fluctuate, their priorities change, then they impose it on the project, and they're the client, they're paying the bills. But making decisions like that has an adverse effect on the workforce. The program. No one here has ever been on a program that's long enough. Everything's been cut down to absolute bare minimum. The RAMs, as we touched on earlier, the risk assessments and method statements. Really, guys, we need to be getting back to getting them done properly. As I said earlier, if we want the guys in the field to take safety seriously, you've got to start by taking it seriously and actually take the time to plan the works, to do the risk assessment first, and then create the method that safely works around the risk you've identified. It's as simple as that. The systems and processes. How many people here, as we touched on earlier, think we've got enough? Do you want some more? No. We've got some great systems and processes. And what health and safety has done for us over the years to get it to this stage is brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And we need to keep hold of that knowledge. But now it's not about the systems and processes. It's about how we're, who we're being when we're using them, how we're engaging people, how we're interacting with people. It's not about the piece of paper. It's about the conversation, the dialogue, the experience, the engagement. Accident investigations. Well, accident investigations tend to 
they, they tend to look at the symptoms. They're not dealing with the cause. The commercial department, how often do they let out tenders that they give it to the cheapest contractor and the cheapest contractor is never the cheapest contractor because it's a battle from day one, it's hard work. So we need to actually get them involved as well and get them to understand that the struggles you're facing day in day out, how the packages are let, and permits, even down to permits. I mean, it's crazy nowadays we have a permit for everything. We've got permit to work, uh, ladder permit, mute permit, roof permit, isolation permit, permit to dig. We're going through permit after permit after permit. And are they really done properly? I mean, I worked on a project many years ago now, back in Dublin. And when I was on that project, to streamline the whole process of permits, what they used to do is at four o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, they would sign off the permits for Friday morning. Friday, they'll sign them off for Monday. Monday, they'll sign them off for Tuesday. Four o'clock every day. So everyone congregated in the room. They all went with their permit books, and they all got signed off. And then the following day, where there was hot works permits, did people have barriers in place? Did they have signage in place? Did they have firefighting equipment in place? No, they didn't. They had the permit. Other, other times of the mutes, was the area segregated off? No, but they had their permit, and it was signed off by management. The management are saying, by signing it off, they're actually saying that they've been and checked it and they're happy with the conditions of it. As I touched earlier, 1974 Health and Safety Work Act, as construction managers, it's your role to give the operatives a safe place to work. That's it. First and foremost, before anything else, you have to give them a safe place to work. And then they have to work to those routines. So we touched on earlier about raising the standards. We looked at the accidents. We need to start dealing with the cause. And the cause is at this end of the scale. It's really at this end of the scale. We are causing everything else to happen. Put it another way, people grow to their environment. I mean, if you lay down with dogs, you come up with fleas. People grow to the environment. We are two-fifths DNA, three-fifths environment. As managers, you get the opportunity to create the environment. Are you grabbing hold of that opportunity? 